Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Cerinthia Parker, um, class of 84. <laughs> I serve on the Inman Page Alumni Council Board of Governors. Um, in my other role, I'm an orthopedic surgeon in Chicago with a special focus on bringing care to underserved communities. I currently work at Jackson Park Hospital where I am the chair of the Division of Orthopedic Surgery and I'm also the medical staff president. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this event along with my organizing co-hosts, Associate Dean Caroline Quo and Associate Dean Joseph Diaz, these associate deans lead the diversity and inclusion portfolios for the School of Public Health and the medical school, respectively. Today, we will hear from three leading health innovators, all Brown graduates, of course. <laughs> they will share their strategies for achieving health equity. We will hear first from Griffin Rogers, Director of the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. Dr. Rogers is an undergraduate, graduate, and medical school alum. Then we will hear from Nicole Alexander Scott, who is on her way. She's the director of the Rhode Island Department of Health. Dr. Alexander Scott received her Master's of Public Health from Brown. Fi um, Finally, we will hear from Cedric Bright, who is the Associate Dean for Inclusive Excellence at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. Dr. Bright uh, is an undergraduate alum from Brown. And residency. I knew him before he was a doctor. But we won't talk about that today. After we hear from the panelists, we will have a chance to engage in a lively discussion moderated by Mario Akande. She's a recent ABMPH graduate from Brown. It was in Mario's time at Brown when she was first exposed to global public health work. She now works globally using the skills acquired at Brown to address health disparities in the areas of sexual and reproductive health sexual violence prevention, and substance abuse. At this time, I'd like to invite Bess Marcus, Dean of the School of Public Health, to the podium to share introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Parker, and I'm just so excited to be here at this wonderful celebration um, and to hear from our exciting panelists. Um, so, um, you know, again, I'm really honored to be here and um, for us to just take a moment and reflect on the important act of resistance by black students that happened here at Brown in 1968. By bravely leading a student walkout, these students laid the foundation for a sea of social change. And we continue to feel the impact of that social change here at Brown and beyond. One of the most enduring legacies of that change include many of you in this room. Um, the collective impact that you all have had, 50 classes of graduates, is indeed a, a real reason to celebrate. Today we will hear about the outstanding contributions of three of our alum from the college, the School of Public Health, and the School of Medicine. Drs. Rogers, Alexander Scott, and Bright have worked tirelessly to champion health equity. In each of their environments, research, state government, and higher education, they have led novel initiatives to advance health equity, reflective of Brown's out-of-the-box approach to tackling pressing challenges. Their passionate commitment to advancing health as a human right is no small feat and has taken a lot of effort. The work that Drs. Rogers, Alexander Scott, and Bright are engaged in requires innovation, outstanding science, and indeed activism. Their dedication is resulting in measurable strides in our efforts to close the gap 
in health disparities faced by communities of color. So let's put our hands together again to welcome our amazing panelists. And now I'd like to, to welcome Dr. Rogers to the podium to start us off by sharing the work he is involved in in leading the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases at NIH. Dr. Rogers. Okay, well thank you. And thanks uh, you all for coming uh, to this uh, this discussion. It's always good to come home again. There's, uh, I forget, I wasn't, a, an English major, but a, a famous stating, a statement about, can you ever go home again? And it's always a pleasure to come here. And I do take every opportunity as a very low bar for getting me to come back to Providence, <laughs> I, I have to tell you. And for those of you who are uh, younger in the audience, once you have kids, it's a lower bar for you to go to the, the city in which they're uh, currently attending school. What I'd like to do in the, in the time allotted uh, in this whole area of, of health equity is to consider for a moment the role that medical research, biomedical research, plays in uh, health equity. Uh, you know, in a sense, science is really a tool uh, for social justice, and in no short measure, biomedical research uh, can accelerate those tool development. So in the time allotted, I'd like to actually consider three areas, sort of a paradigm of chronic disease progression that my institute uh, is actively involved in and tell you how we're using this knowledge and the data that we collect to develop better treatments and prevention of three critical areas, diseases that are common and chronic and costly and quite consequential, obesity, diabetes, kidney disease. And these are particularly important as we talk about health equity because as I'm sure all of you are aware, these these conditions and disorders disproportionately affect underrepresented groups within this country. And then I'd like to sort of tell you a little bit about where we're going in the future. Uh, certainly when we were all here in medical school, uh, um, it's more or less you treat someone with a drug that generally works, it's FDA approved, but it's approved, but in certain instances it doesn't work at all. In the worst cases, it actually causes harm to the patient. And so rather than a one-size-fits-all approach, we're thinking about an area of precision and personalized medicine in which you can get the right drug to the right person at the right time. So let me see if, uh, if time a lot, we'll try to talk about that a bit. The three areas that, that I wanted to sort of bring into sharp focus is obesity, type 2 diabetes, and chronic kidney diseases. These are three conditions that my institute is responsible for both conducting and supporting research across this country and to some extent around the world in these diseases. Now I mentioned uh, using the best opportunity that I could in alliteration that they're common, they're chronic, and they're costly, and they're consequential. Let me just show you the numbers. Approximately two-thirds of Americans are currently considered, adults are considered to be overweight or obese. 40% of U.S. adults are obese. Increasingly, we're seeing this in kids, and the, an estimate from a number of years ago, uh, a figure of uh, about $147 billion per year. Diabetes, and I'm gonna go and elaborate into this in some detail, 30.3 million Americans uh, suffer with diabetes. That's about nine and a half or 10% of the uh, population. Uh, and of course, the vast majority of this is type two diabetes, which directly, what we used to call adult onset. But unfortunately, because of the obesity epidemic, increasingly we're seeing type two diabetes in kids as young as 12 and 13 and 14. And I can tell you firsthand from funding a number of studies that the kids with this disease, not the same as kids that have autoimmune or juvenile diabetes. They develop complications much sooner, and their, their therapy for their disease, they're much more refractory to therapy. This uh, uh, most recent estimate is in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And then chronic kidney disease. Roughly 15% of the of, uh, U.S. population have chronic kidney disease, but an overwhelming number will go on to develop uh, end-stage kidney disease requiring dialysis. 
and I mentioned these diseases disproportionately affect people of color. Look at these numbers, 47% of Hispanics and, and 46% of uh, non-Hispanic blacks compared to about 38% of, of whites are considered obese. In terms of diabetes, the highest incidence are in American Indians and Alaska Natives, about 15%, 12% uh, in, uh, in non-Hispanic blacks, uh, and uh, it, both in blacks as well as in Hispanics. And then end-stage renal disease, three times higher in African Americans. You know, you, blacks make up 13% of the population, but they account for over 30% of the people in dialysis centers around the country. And I'm going to tell you how, what, what research has taught us about this that might, we may learn from uh, ultimately to prevent its progression, but also uh, uh, ultimately to cure this condition. Here are the health consequences associated with diabetes. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there's really no organ system that, that spared the ravages. We always think about heart disease and lung disease and obviously arthritis, but, but GYN conditions, liver disease, there are certain cancers that absolutely are associated with uh, having fat, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, uh, kidney cancer, uh, diseases that are becoming much more uh, rampant because of this obesity epidemic. Uh, high blood pressure, for example. But for this, let me talk uh, in a moment about diabetes. The, the prevalence of obesity is increasing largely, and we're seeing it more and more, as I mentioned, in kids. 17% between the ages of 2 to 19 by the estimates for the Center of Disease Control. Here are a few examples of what research that we're conducting and supporting to address this issue, something that uh, um, we've been very pleased with. And one of these I'm going to tell you a little bit more, but these are a host of lifestyle interventions, including environmental and behavioral interventions, both in terms of people at high risk for developing diabetes to prevent them from developing it, realizing that if you intervene early, in uh, expecting mothers that you actually develop a twofold benefit, both for the mother as well as for that infant. And then uh, behavioral studies like look ahead in people who have already developed a disease, but we're hoping for them to prevent them from developing complications. Bariatric surgery, as many of you know that many people who are extremely obese, when diet and exercise and medications fail, and they are so, they're having many of these associated complications that I showed you on the previous slide, that bariatric surgery offers a great benefit. In fact, many people, uh, many centers are now marketing themselves as a metabolic surgery as opposed to bariatric surgery. We know that within days of bariatric surgery, even before people have lost substantial amount of weight, their metabolic condition normalizes, they no longer have high blood pressure, we don't quite yet understand the durability of those effects, and this is something that we're actively studying. Certainly it's a, uh, effective in a year or two, but what about 10 years? What about 15 years? What's the long-term consequences? At the same time, we're trying to understand what the molecular basis of these improvements and ameliorations of these associated conditions, because if we understand the molecular basis, we might have the opportunity to replicate that and derive the benefits of bariatric surgery without having the risk of actually undergoing surgery. Here's something that when I was in medical school here, we were told that there was only one type of fat, white adipose fat, which is where we store most of our calories, particularly around our waist. And there is a second type of fat, interestingly called brown fat. So I'm sure you will, when you leave here, you'll remember what brown can do for you. <clears throat> Well, brown fat is great in that instead of storing fat, it actually burns calories. It's thermogenic. And there's an intermediate type of fat called beige fat. And what scientists have realized is that one can harness the power of this brown fat by turning it back on in adults to actually burn away the calories that are being stored in the white adipose tissue. You're going to be hearing a lot more about this in the years to come. And one other very exciting period, and I hasten to tell you this, uh, right after lunch, but every time you eat, you dine with a hundred trillion friends and the forms of the microbes and the viruses and the fungi that reside in our gastrointestinal tract. We actually aren't 
just the human genome, but we're actually metagenomic species. We co-evolve with bacteria that reside in us. And these bacteria and fungi and other species have an ability to either enhance our metabolism or to weaken it, uh, and that we hope that in the future, in the form of probiotics or prebiotics, when we know more about this, this might be a very effective therapy for, uh, for obesity. It goes without saying, though, that anything that we can do to lessen the complications associated with obesity might have the potential of uh, forestalling, delaying, or preventing those host of complications that I showed you on that slide. Now, here's a slide that shows you the direct nexus between the obesity epidemic uh, as portrayed and defined by the Centers for Disease Control uh, from 90s to uh, 2000s. And here are the same states in which one is seeing an increasing prevalence of, of diabetes. You can almost superimpose these two maps. I realized that when I was uh, first became the director of NIH, I did a congressional briefing, and I realized I was showing all these blue states becoming red states. <laughs> and I realized I wasn't trying to make a political statement, so I blamed this on the CDC. We didn't choose the colors. It was, it was our host, uh, our friends uh, down in Atlanta. What I told you about that 30 million people with diabetes, again, the vast majority have type 2 diabetes. That's just the tip of the iceberg. There are a number of 84 million people who have prediabetes. Their blood sugar isn't exactly normal, but it isn't high enough yet to be considered to have frank diabetes. These people are at high risk in five or 10 years of going on to develop diabetes. So when you add these numbers together, that's uh, over 111 million. So one in three, and it's probably a little bit more than that, either has diabetes or at extremely high risk for developing it. And as we develop better tools and treatments for people with diabetes, in order to really bend the cost curve, you have to do something about the people underneath the water that, are, that are, could surface at any time. What I'd like to tell you about is a program called our Diabetes Prevention Program. And the reason I'd like to highlight this program, it was because it was a Brown uh, faculty member, Dr. Rena Wing, when she was in Pittsburgh, who actually developed the protocol, a very simple protocol that was, in, that was used in this study to show that you can actually prevent or delay those people at high risk from developing diabetes. There were over 3,200 participants. We oversampled uh, in minority populations just to make sure that anything that comes out of this could be extrapolatable to the certain populations. And we compared really three approaches, a placebo with general instructions to metformin uh, to lifestyle. And the goal here was somewhat modest, to lose about 5 or 7 percent of your body weight with reducing your caloric intake modestly and exercising about 30 minutes a day, five days a week. So it wasn't an enormous uh, push. But this was done in a way in which we had people do one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions to uh, get them up to speed, and then we follow them. And here's why it's important to make sure that you have a diverse group in terms of health equity that uh, in this sample, as I mentioned, we oversampled for uh, underrepresented groups. And essentially, the trend lines look the same. Compared to placebo, those people who went on to develop diabetes just with general instructions, metformin, the first drug used in diabetes, reduced overall their likelihood of developing diabetes uh, by about 31%. The people who received this lifestyle intervention, there was about a 58 percent reduction uh, in this. And so even though you're at risk, that doesn't mean that that's absolutely what's going to happen. There are modifiable factors that one can consider. And the reason I show you this slide is twofold. When we look specifically at how, uh, at various age groups, it looks like the younger people tended to have the best effect with metformin. Again, uh, shown there compared to lifestyle, metformin in people 25 to 44 was almost equally effective. Uh, on the other hand, people were over 60, not so much. But where you got the greatest bang for the buck is in people who are over 60 uh, at the beginning of this trial with lifestyle. I told you overall there was about a 58% reduction, but in people over 60, there was a 70% reduction. The take-home point here is never too late to start. 
Uh, we were told going into this trial, you'll never get people over 60 to exercise. And even if you do, they're not going to continue to do it. Well, in fact, they have. This study is now 15 years old, still ongoing. We have a 95% retention in those original <clears throat> people in the trial. And this lifestyle intervention, 16-week sessions that people still continue to exercise, has a, a durable and enduring effect. Let me just turn now from diabetes to kidney disease and to point out that diabetes, of course, is a leading cause of kidney disease in this country. And, <clears throat> and in fact, in terms of people with kidney disease going on to develop end-stage kidney disease, it's an amplification in African Americans. Uh, 30% amplification. Why is that? Well, here's a, a basketball player that many of you may be familiar with, Alonzo Mourning. He, like several others, have undergone a kidney transplant because they have a particular type of kidney disease, FSGS, that's very common in blacks. In fact, the lifetime risk for developing end-stage renal disease is 2% in whites, but it's more than threefold greater in blacks. And that is because, and now we have, because of biomedical research, an explanation that we can account for almost all of this based upon a particular gene, variant of a gene called ApoL1 gene. The advantage of having these variants, that if you are in old world Africa and you happen to be bitten by a tsetse fly carrying African sleeping sickness, you would, you would actually um, not be at greater risk compared to if you had a normal uh, gene structure. But of course, there's no African sleeping disease in this country, and this gene variant has a major effect on kidneys, which isn't completely understood now. So the genetics are very important, and I, I, I raise this for something moving to the future, that as we're thinking now about data science, we think that most people should have their genetic makeup examine. But you only need to do this once. Your genes don't actually change. It's really the environmental factors and some of your behaviors that actually turn risk into reality. Uh, but in the area of data science now, increasingly, as we see uh, our, our healthcare providers, they're putting our information in electronic health records. These are seen, obviously, every year or even uh, more frequently. But think about it. Even if you're seen once a year, a 30-minute visit to your uh, physician's office, that only represents 0.005% of your entire year. And if you are seen four times a year, that brings it up to 0.02. That's a small period of time. Increasingly, what we're going to be seeing, and this is work that, that we're funding, is using body sensors to capture information about body in indices, blood pressure, uh, glucose measurements, a number of other things that can be all um, co collated in a way to really give you good health indicators a long time. So our data science moving to precision medicine and beyond are things that we're currently integrating looking towards the future. With that in mind, and as I close, I'd like to bring your attention to something that is being hosted more broadly by the NIH. And that's called the All of Us Personalized Medicine Program. Here the goal is to hope to get a million participants to sign up for this to first gather their health information on the form of questionnaires, ultimately their genomic, their epigenomic, their microbiome, many other omics, perhaps limited only by economics, information will, will, will be gathered and collated and, and presented. And I, I was, uh, we launched this program on May the 7th of this year. I happened to go down to Birmingham to assist in the launch uh, at that site. And I have to say that it was important that I go to Birmingham because at that site, we had a person speaking just before me who was from the Tuskegee Institute. And as you can imagine, it still comes to mind when people think about enrolling and participating in trials, some of the ethical issues, and he really gave a very inspiring speech about why it is people in our, in our communities really do need to, to invest and get engaged so that they can learn from and they are not left further behind because this will only exacerbate health disparities uh, and health equities. For those of you who would like to learn more about this, you can visit the site, joinallofus.org. 
uh, and, and learn either how you can participate through your own physician or through Walgreens and other places actually walking in and, and participating. The one final thing that I will say before I close is that despite what we will learn in research, we already know two important facts that are undeniable. We know, A, that the longer, uh, the more you exercise, the longer you're likely to live. The second undeniable fact is the longer your parents live, the longer you're likely to live. Now, most people take these two bits of facts, but hope, hopefully not brown educated people, and they come to the conclusion that the key to their longevity is just to get their parents to exercise more. <laughs> <clears throat> Believe me, that's not the case. Exercising has to be a to, on your to-do list every day. With that, I'll close, and thank you for the kind introduction. Good afternoon. <laughs> it's an honor for me to be here and to um, be on the panel um, with such distinguished panelists, and it is such a welcome sight to see such a beautifully colorful audience to be able to speak to. So welcome, everyone, as I um, wait for slides to graciously come up. Um, Nicole Alexander Scott, I'm an adult and pediatric, thank you, sir, infectious disease physician, um, originally from Brooklyn, New York, and a, <laughs> uh <-oh. laughs> um, a Cornell undergrad uh, alumnus, and um, proud to be a Brown alumnus for our, from the adult and pediatric infectious disease fellowship program here, as well as from the MPH program. So, um, I'm also honored to be director of the state, uh, Rhode Island Department of Health since 2015, and have been able to compile the life experiences starting um, you know, from Brooklyn and um, family, as well as the educational experiences to um, land with where we are with what's important for us as a state and our vision for going forward. So I'm going to briefly, say on uh, time as much as possible, um, give a quick framework of what our strategic priorities have been as a department, and then use that to highlight two key initiatives and approaches we have for implementing those priorities, and finish quickly with um, an opportunity that um, is embarking and uh, occurring uh, this month uh, to be able to continue that work and welcome the partnership of all those here to uh, join with me. So we had um, a touch on life expectancy in the wonderful presentation that um, preceded me, and to be able to highlight the fact that as a country, we have significant room for improvement um, to make life expectancy better. I like to highlight from this slide, if you look at how much we spend on health care, um, compared to how other developed countries, how much they spend on health care, we would be doing okay if um, Americans lived to 125 years of age as a standard. But um, there are other countries that spend half as much as we do who have better life expectancies than we do. The other critical um, data point is for the first time in 50 years, we've had a year-over-year -year decrease in life expectancy for the US going in the wrong direction. We need to do something drastic to change that. I also show the second slide that highlights some opportunities for what we can learn from those states, from those other developed countries, in terms of doing something drastic. Um, the tall, the bar that's circled shows the blue part of the bar for the US being the highest, which means, similar to the previous slide, we as a country spend the most on health care 
compared to other developed countries um, where you see the ratio to the red part of the bar, which is how much is spent on social services, ambulatory care, prevention, addressing determinants of health, community-based services. Those are all the categories that are really represented in that red part of the bar. And so one of our major um, focal points is to work on shifting investments from too much in that healthcare setting for us to going more so into community prevention, addressing determinants of health, as other countries has, have recognized is important uh, to do. This is the last way to really emphasize this. This is a pie graph that um, demonstrates um, all of the different components that go into someone being healthy. And if you notice, clinical care makes up only 10% of this pie graph, and that clinical care is analogous to the blue part of the bar that was on the previous graph. So in essence, the U.S. puts about 75% of our investments into 10% of what determines how healthy someone is. There's another 10% that's genetics, but the remaining 80% is social and economic factors, physical environment, and the healthy behaviors that are based on those components. We need to do something differently, shifting our investments from 75% going into 10% and 25% going into 80% to at least 50-50, going into that 80% to really get the health outcomes that we want and to reverse the life expectancy trend that we do not want to see for our children and grandchildren. That's the basis, the why, for our strategic framework um, diagram as a department. Um, in knowing that we need to shift investments, we have three leading priorities to get us there. Address social, economic, and environmental determinants of health. By doing that, we will eliminate disparities of health and promote health equity. For health equity, we use the terminology to say regardless of the zip code that you're from, being from Brooklyn, we're very familiar with walking a block difference and knowing that you will see different life expectancy outcomes. So regardless of the zip code that you're from, you should have access to living the healthiest life you can live, you and your parents, and living in the healthiest community that you can live in. That's what we want to see with health equity. It really sets a vision for many of us knowing that that is not the case right now. And then also to be able to ensure access to quality health services for all Rhode Islanders, um, including our most vulnerable population, being those that may not have the voice to advocate for themselves. So that's what our key is. We have three purposely broad leading priorities that we um, focus into five strategies for moving us forward, which really just touch on healthy living for all through all stages of life as our first strategy. A second one is a more environmentally focused strategy that looks at um, access to healthy food, safe water, um, cleaner environments. Our third one is a strategy that looks at promoting a comprehensive health system that everyone can navigate, access, and afford. And if you use oral health, physical health, and behavioral health as your definition of a health system, which is what we do for a comprehensive health system, we all know someone that has had challenges navigating, accessing, or affording something in the behavioral health, physical health, or oral health system. So that's a general strategy. Our fourth one, addresses what public health is often known for, preventing against emergent hazards and emergent threats. So Zika virus, uh, Ebola virus, uh, flu pandemic, um, but we also include violence, the overdose uh, epidemic, adverse childhood experiences in those emergent threats. And then our fifth strategy talks about the fact that we do data very well within public health, and we want to be very deliberate about using that data to drive action, to tell a story so that we can impact. And then this just highlights how those three leading priorities focus us into five general strategies, and I know you cannot read it, but to really show that each strategy has a number of population health goals that align with Healthy People 2020 goals so that we have clear metrics that we're able to measure against as a department and compare apples to apples with other states and push towards 
um, specific goals. So that's our strategic framework. And to spend a few minutes um, highlighting our two major approaches to getting us there. We know we need to shift investments from high acuity healthcare setting that only makes up 10% of how healthy someone is to community-based services and settings, ambulatory care prevention, addressing determinants of health. We have goals to get us there that align with national goals. Our two major approaches um, include one that goes through the clinical setting to help advance that shift in um, funding. So um, we have community health workers as an example, inserting into the current healthcare setting professions, um, programs, initiatives that are going to help the clinical setting direct their attention towards the community. Community health workers insert into the healthcare setting, go into the homes, into the community, um, and work with um, families and patients to address and navigate those social services. That's one way to shift our investments to focus towards the community. There are a number of national initiatives as well. CDC has a 618 initiative. CMS, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, has an Accountable Health Communities initiative. They've also funded a state innovation model test grant that many states have done. All of those really approach that for that one category of going through the clinical setting into the community. Our other major approach that we know is absolutely necessary and there's probably less material and initiatives there that we really want to make prominent is going directly to the community. And that's our approach with the Health Equity Zones Initiative. Um, in Rhode Island, um, we decided to bring together a place-based, community-led approach. We had noticed over the years from our um, colleagues and federal partners, we were getting funding in silos. Here's money for diabetes, money for um, uh, heart disease, money for asthma, money for cancer prevention, and we were giving it to the community because our research to support it has all been necessary and complements our work, but we were seeing that at the community level, we were giving it to the same people in silos, but they were not breaking themselves up into silos, and they were not getting better. So similar to knowing what was happening with our life expectancy, we said we need to do something differently. And so this was our approach to really putting action to knowing that we needed to incorporate health equity into the work that we're doing. We have taken the funding, braided it, and have continual conversations with CDC and our other federal partners to support us in that process and give funding to communities in a place-based way that really emphasizes the importance of the community leading the process, supported by our public health principles. So we ask the community to organize. Many communities are doing things to address these needs, but organize those efforts, coordinate it, have it be data-driven, develop an action plan to follow after with shared goals evaluate those goals, and then come up with mechanisms for sustaining it. Those are some of those core public health principles that we think of, making sure it's data-driven, making sure that there are actionable, smart objectives that um, the community is unified in working towards so that there's a structure with it, evaluate it so that it can be improved, and then put things in place to sustain it. And so that's in essence what our Health Equity Zones initiative um, has done. We have nine health equity zones throughout um, the state of uh, uh, Rhode Island and continually working towards ways to sustain um, that work. One of the keys is supporting the backbone organization that we've asked each collaborative to establish, which really serves as the glue for the community um, coordination to occur in order to really see those outcomes and apply the public health principles that I just shared. So that this way we can build on the strengths and assets in communities and the work that's been going heartfelt for years and years, bring it together, organize everyone um, moving towards shared goals together and measure the outcomes that are needed and use that to say this is an infrastructure that we need to continue to invest in and this is how we can implement those um, public health prevention 
um, interventions in place. So we have DPP engaging with um, uh, our communities and our health equity zones. They have a lot to say about it, but we are working with them on it. And so there are multiple examples of our HES um, uh, successes. Uh, our, our focus has been use this as an opportunity to empower the community voice um, to change policies and change the systems that we know have plagued those communities um, for, for so many years. And so we have the opportunity to take the disparities that we know exist and put things in place that allow us to address the determinants of health to actually change them from a community-led perspective. So that's one of our most exciting approaches to health equity from a public health perspective. And given the time frame, I will um, finish with talking about um, the last component, which is our approach with building on that model um, as a foundation, the health equity zones model, and knowing the importance of having a community-driven approach. As director of the Department of Health for Rhode Island, I'm able to be a member of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, which is all um, directors of uh, state agencies um, across the country that report to governors, um, as well as the territorial um, uh, jurisdictions that are in uh, my position. I've been honored that they've uh, elected me to be president of the board starting for the end of uh, September of uh, this year. And what it does is offers a, a national platform for really talking about community-led approaches because that's going to be the focus as president. <laughs> um, we each have a president's challenge and so um, ours is going to be building healthy and resilient communities. The nice opportunity we have is for the first time to be able to partner with NACHO, which is the National Association of County and City Health Officials, so that the state health officials and the local health officials can work together on bringing communities forward, empowering their voice, and changing policies and systems impacting those communities. And our colleague, the Surgeon General, um, Dr. Jerome Adams, who also has a focus on community health and economic prosperity in recognizing that um, we need to engage business, um, communities, corporate sector to invest in um, their surrounding communities so that we can sustain these community-led efforts. So that's the essence of the two major goals for the President's Challenge. The first is mobilize these organized community-led efforts like Rhode Island Health Equity Zones in jurisdictions throughout the, the country, um, elevating the opportunity for communities to lead the change that they know is, is necessary and to support them in that process, and then to also um, support health officials, public health, and other sectors in engaging with newer partners like the business community and the corporate sector in understanding the importance of the money that they have being invested in the community. So talking to the other CDC, the Community Development Corporations and um, Federal Reserve Banks and others that are obligated to invest in community and connect them directly to those evidence-based um, community-led approaches such as um, the health equity zones. So honored to have that opportunity and to um, really um, show what Rhode Island has done, knowing the state and local approach that we have here since there's only one health department, and certainly welcome the partnership of um, you all in helping to achieve and really spread this message, make it a movement about shifting our investments to the place where we know health happens and having it be a community-led process. So thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, y'all can do better than that. Y'all know I'm from the South. Y'all already heard me say y'all twice. Good afternoon. All right, good to be in the land of the living. So um, I'm Dr. Cedric Bright. I am a general internist, um, Brown class of 1985. 
um, and a graduate of the um, Rhode Island Hospital Internal Medicine Residency Program in 1983, 1993, excuse me. That, that would have been backwards, uh, which I've been known to moonwalk, but not that well. Um, and then uh, I had the, the privilege to work on the faculty here at Brown uh, until 1997. Um, and so it's indeed an honor to come back and be a part of this <coughs> panel there. I'm sitting here and looking out in the audience, and I see so many people that are a heck, a heck of a lot more prominent than uh, myself, and I feel a little inadequate in this space uh, because many of these folks are my mentors. Um, and I would just have to say that, uh, indeed, I'm grateful and I recognize that, um, that I am in this place because of only because I've got the opportunity to stand on their shoulders. And what I try to do is to prepare my shoulders for the next generation of students that are coming along since they can then serve their communities the way that I hope that I'm serving mine. So I'm here today to talk to you about pipeline programs. And, and the reason why we want to talk about pipeline programs is because of the, change of demo, the changing demography of the United States. Uh, in 2012 was the first year in which there were more students of uh, first graders who were minority than majority. We know that the average age, that's true. We know that the average age of, of, uh, of women in America are changing and those who are bearing our children is changing. The average age of a white woman in America is now about 42. The average age of African Americans is about 34. The average age of a Hispanic in America woman is 26. Who's having babies? Okay. One of the biggest issues, this is why this is such an issue about immigration. Because immigration fuels the changing of our demography. So we have to understand that. Now the next part of that is what's the economic aspect behind this? Well, we know that healthcare disparities cost about 1.24 trillion. Am I right about that, Griff? Okay. About 1.24 trillion, right? We spend almost 17% to 18% of our gross domestic product on healthcare. If our demography changes such that we are now a majority minority population or majority minority, population, because we're not minority, we've been minoritized, then that stands to figure that the increase in, of our GDP will be spent because of that. To the point that if we don't make changes by 2025, we could be spending almost 25% of our GDP on health care. As a nation, I don't quite think that's sustainable. So we have to find a way in which to try to address these issues of health disparities. And if I don't know how many of y'all saw the recent Stanford article that came out that talked about health care for black males, that black males actually have better health outcomes if they are treated by black physicians, okay? How many of y'all have seen the work of Lisa Cooper that talks about how having race congruence increases patient satisfaction, patient outcomes, as well as patient compliance, okay? How many of you also understand that if you have a diverse medical school class, your majority students come out better because they have the ability to be exposed to people who are different than themselves? One of my favorite quotes is, if all of us are, the, if all of us are thinking the same, then none of us are thinking. <laughs> right? That's the value of diversity. It's not just diversity of pigment. It's not about diversity just of religion. It's not about diversity of gender or gender identification. It's about diversity of thought. It's about diversity of experience. It's about diversity of, of, of lineage and understanding the economic challenges of people who come from little means compared to those that come from big means. I listened today and somebody talked to me about the chancellor gave a $50 million gift to the medical school here at Brown. I said, like, wow. Did that come from an endowment? No, that came from his personal finances. <laughs> Somebody help me find a job <laughs> that I can earn so much money that I can, because I would give Brown $50 million if I had 60 million. I would, right? 
But the bottom line is, is I come from two parents who were public school teachers in, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, that when I became a resident, Shelley, I earned more money as a first-year resident than my parents earned in 25 years of public school teaching. And who's taking care of our kids for the future are those teachers. But yet those are the people we will pay the least, right? I'm sorry, I've digressed. <laughs> See, that's what happens when you're president of something in the past and it just keeps coming out of you. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the Medical Education Development Program because this is a program in which I was privileged to go through when I went to medical school, at, before I went to medical school at UNC. And I have to tell you that if I had not have gone through this program, I probably would not have been successful because this program taught me the rigor of how I needed to study in order to be ready to be competitive in medical school. Um, my, my disclosures is that I have you know, no, no financial obligation of anything. I'm not selling you a product. Um, I am on Twitter. My handle is Cedric M. Bright, MD, if you want to follow me on Twitter. Um, and that's all I have to disclose today. <laughs> the history of the MED program is that it was funded in 1973. This is very historic because this was at the time in which pr predominantly white medical schools were first beginning to integrate. And probably almost 80% of the students that were going to those schools were coming from historically black colleges. And so the thought was by the government that we need to have some type of programs that were put in place that helped to layer, to, to, to uh, level the playing field for students who were coming out of HBCUs to come to these predominantly white colleges for medical school. Understand the concept. Most of our HBCUs were not developed to make scientists. They were there to make teachers. Some places, engineers, if you went to a and you know? Um, and other places, social workers. Other places, religion, pastors. That was what our schools that we were endowed to do, not make doctors, because that was the lineage of Jim Crow. Just saying. So they decided they needed to build this type of a program, and HRSA was nice enough to come up with the type of funding for it, and the whole goal was to help level the playing field. In our MED program, we've had over 3,000 students. I said it's 28 there, but we had over 3,000 students that have come through the program since 1974. I did it in 1986. We've had over 1,600 students that have gone on to graduate from a, from, to, to actually earn, uh, to earn a degree, either as an MD, a, di a dentist, or as a other allied health professional. What this program has been very strong in doing is identifying talent to move forward in our medical school graduate pipeline. We only have 80 positions in the program. We have 60 medical and 20 dental. Uh, and they're funded now by the School of Medicine and the School of, of Dentistry. You know, the whole point of this program was that, that schools would get to success of these programs and then take over the funding for those programs. And we're lucky at UNC that they did. There are many other schools, once the HRSA funding dried up, goodbye. So that's been a challenge. So how do you develop a proper pipeline? Well, you got to have vision. You have to have a vision. You have to figure out what is the need. You have to have a mission. Now, I've always heard it said that if you got no money, you got no mission, right? So you have to make sure that your mission finds some money. Otherwise, you got a hallucination. <laughs> Next thing is, you have to be intentional. You have to be intentional. You know, one of the things that I worry about in this climate that we're in right now is we're beginning to pull back from being intentional. We're beginning to apologize for trying to level the playing field. We're feeling as though we have stolen something because we are giving something to people that have been stolen from since we arrived on this continent. <laughs> no, that is the wrong perspective that we should have. In fact, we should be emboldened to be even better. We should be saying we should be doing more. We should want to lead by example and not follow the crowd that we have going on right now. You have to have in relationships. It has to be longitudinal. You gotta collect data. You know, data is so key nowadays because 
The days of anecdotal and making people feel bad have gone away. You either have to have data, and if you have data, you have to have an economic argument. I'm going to show you some of that economic argument. Now, here's a very important, here's the one type of a pipeline. This is called a leaky pipeline, okay? Now, in this graphic, some of y'all may have seen a similar version by Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, president of Morehouse Medical School. I adapted her, program, I adapted her slide to bring in just a couple of facts that I wanted to make sure we highlighted. You know, we have 52% of African-American males. This is about African-American males. African-American males who graduated from high school. Of the 52% that graduated from high school, only 36% of them went on to go to college. Of that 36% that went on to go to college, only 33% of them actually graduated in four or five years. Of that 33% that actually graduated, only 1,320 of them submitted applications for medical school. Okay? Now, what's important is that, and I don't have my glasses, but there's a, <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have, my bad. Uh, but there's a much larger number. That, that, third, that 1320 only represents about 46% of African American males who took the MCAT. That means 54% of them never even applied. That's a big leap in your, a big leak in your pipeline. Right? That is an area we need to study. Now, what we also need to study is, of those that applied that didn't get in, how many of them reapplied? Because if we don't understand why they did not reapply, we're missing another opportunity. Okay? But what's the other, what's so daunting to me is look at this other side where you see that, that we have 3,074. We have almost three times as many going into, the, into the, the correction system than we have coming to apply for medical school. That's, that's per 100,000. The incarceration rate for African-American males is six times that of whites and Hispanics, okay? So when you see an African-American male in medical school, y'all need to run up to him and hug that brother and give him a high five and tell him congratulations for escaping the big trap the big societal trap. Because it's not easy to get along all these ways, because just take a look around this room. Who belongs here? It ain't me. I don't see nobody on this wall that look like me. When that student walks in that door and they look in these halls and they look around, they see nobody that looks like them, how do you think they feel? Just saying. So we have to do something about not only what we show, what we project, but how we come back with the story that tells the story to help people understand that even though you may not see yourself, you belong. And part of that is making sure that we have faculty, which I am blessed to be. Here's a pipeline that's another pipeline that's more, that is a little more successful. This is our one at Carolina. What you can see there are multiple touches starting in the elementary school coming all the way to the beginning of college with McNair Scholars and Summer Bridge Program that then lead into summer programs. You know, one of the things that many of our, our young people don't know is that there are different summer programs that they can participate in that will help to make them more competitive. And that's some of the things that we need to get out. We need to help our students understand what is the social capital that allow you to be the best competitive applicant that you can be. And that's some of the work that we try to do at Carolina. You know, that, that whole comes down to those programs. SEP is a, a summer enrichment, science enrichment program, which helps to prepare students for the next level of science. So like, for instance, if you're a freshman, and the next year you're going to be taking organic, that summer you take organic, right? And the whole premise is, is by taking organic that summer, you can mess it up as bad as you have to, OK? But hopefully you're going to get some of it while you're messing it up. Such so that when you get to college, you're a little bit ahead, or maybe you finally caught up to some of those other folks that had AP calculus, AP chemistry while they were in high school, and now you can actually fight at the same level that they fight. Okay? So that's the premise for that. Uh, the SMDEP program, which is now another acronym that's probably with Johnson's funded, um, is another program that we also encourage our students to participate in. And then the MED program, you see you come out as a medical professional. So 
Relationships, I talked about relationships. In North Carolina, we're blessed to have 11 HBCUs in our, in our state. And therefore, we make it a priority to make sure that we get students from those schools as well as our students from Carolina. Obviously, you can see we have a large contingency of, of students, of not only color, let me just first make this clear. This program is not about black and white or just black. This program is about disadvantage. So you could be a white student who's a first generation coming from rural Anson County, North Carolina, and we'll take you in the program, okay? You could also be a student, you could be the, the son of a doctor from Durham, North Carolina, and be a part of this program. Why? Because we're trying to mix people together. We're trying to pay high flyers and low flyers and put them together such that the high flyers learn how to teach the low flyers, and the low flyers may have some life experiences these high flyers never seen, never heard of, and they can teach them life experience and help them grow in resilience. Because you have to have resilience in order to succeed, okay? I'm trying to move fast, I'm trying to move fast. We talk about North Carolina Central, we talk about UNC Pembroke, which is our Native American uh, historical uh, med uh, college in North Carolina. You see, we got Morehouse, we have Spelman, uh, we even have some folks from Duke. <coughs> <laughs> um, just to kind of give you some idea of what our GPAs look like, you know, you'll see that we have, uh, mostly have science GPAs that are a little bit lower than our overall GPAs. But more importantly, I think that you'll see that when you look at our HBCUs, you'll see that our HBCU students have higher GPAs than our predominantly white students, I mean predominantly white colleges. So therefore, part of this program is helping to level that playing field because sometimes the students that have come from those schools perform less well and the students from our programs perform better. And so we're trying to make sure we have the right milieu in order to get everybody working at almost the same level. So here's the big statement, and I'll, I'll tell you what, I might just cut off some of these slides so we can have more time to talk. Uh, but we talk about return on investment. You gotta have an economic argument. So I talked about the aspect that we have over 3,000 graduates, 800 MDs, 500 dentists, 550 others. Stop. What is the average economic footprint of a physician in America? It's about 1.5 million. 1.5 million. And that's just average, right? 800 physicians, $1.5 million. I could give $50 million back if I had that, right? This is the point that we need to understand, because these folks are going out there creating jobs in their communities. They are paying taxes. They are helping to support uh, charitable contributions to the, 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 the programs that are trying to address the issues in their communities. That's where the economic impact of these physicians come into play and these dentists come into play. You know, we have students that apply to our medical school. We have 44% of them that are interviewed. Of that 44%, 68, only 68% only, only of them accepted. Only 68. So I had a dilemma. And my dilemma was, who am I doing this program for? Because if Carolina's paying for it, wouldn't you expect Carolina to want to take more? To take them all? But I had to come and understand, they can't take them all. So my new perspective became, I'm preparing these students to make their dream come true. If it happens to be a Carolina, I'm more happy for it. But if it's Howard, if it's Meharry, if it's University of Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, if it's Auburn, if it's a DO school, it's a chiropractic school, if their dream becomes to become that doctor and they make it, then it's been a success for me. Now, more importantly, we have them accepted, but more importantly, they graduate. The measure of a medical school is not how many people you bring in, but it's how many people you graduate. And I'll go one step further. The measure of a medical school is not how many A students you bring in that graduate as A students. You ain't educated them, you babysat them. You wanna educate somebody, bring in a C student and graduate an A student. Now you done educated somebody. Think about that. These are the numbers of students that have applied and the numbers that we've had that have been accepted to Carolina. 
And what we will tell you about this program is that these students actually go back and, and practice medicine in what water call professional, health professional shortage areas. Um, and this is very important because this goes to show that, you know, they say, I want to come in and go back and serve my community. Well, in actuality, our students actually do go back and do that. And that makes a big difference in our state of North Carolina. So we, our graduates make up about 12% of all doctors in the state of North Carolina, African American, but they make up 35% um, of all the Native American. You know, we go and we're more likely to practice in primary care, but we're less likely to be in general surgery, and we're equally likely to be in psychiatry. And we do have a large need for psychiatry and mental health services. <laughs> if you don't know, now you know. 66% uh, of, of all the African American of all the African American graduates in North Carolina who are um, practicing in the state, 66% of them came through our MED program. 59% of all the Native Americans or physicians who are practicing in North Carolina who graduated from Carolina came from that program. So indeed, Carolina takes more than its lion's share, but there's still more that we can take. And you see, once again, rural counties, health professional shortage area. Tier one counties are economically most disadvantaged. And this is just a picture of uh, areas across the state of North Carolina, um, from that large cluster that you kind of see in the middle all the way to the east. All of that was flooded last week. It's still flooded this week. I'm fortunate that I'm, I'm just to the left of those dots. Uh, and by that, by the grace of God, I'm here today. So I think I'm going to skip on these numbers. Uh, well, maybe I should talk a little bit about this, because this is a big factor. You know, the MCAT is a big impediment for students to get into medical school. And here's the reason why. Most folks, medical schools cut off at 500 to say, we don't look at anybody below a 500 MCAT, OK? The problem is that African Americans average is at not a 496. So if you cut off at 500, you've already eliminated over 65 to 70 percent of African Americans from your pool straight off the bat. You can see the Hispanic score is about 499, Asian and white are 506. Okay. Now studies show that there's no difference in the graduation rate between somebody that scores in that 496 area compared to somebody that scores in the 508 area, but yet we will use that as a cutoff. That is something that we need to examine. Um, and then the other thing that we have to be aware of is that we have, uh, of our matriculants to medical school, that we have 1,535 females, black females, self-identified black females who matriculated to medical school. 698 of them were U.S. born. Of our males, we had 556, which is up from less than 500 in 2014, which was lower than 1978. Uh, but only 271 of them are US born descendants of slaves. So we have to be cognizant of that issue as well. So some of the schools with the highest number of African American students, Meharry, Howard, Morehouse, no, no, no questions about those, they're HBCU schools. Um, so as UCLA withdrew, um, added to their number. Indiana and Illinois have classes that are almost 250 to 280 students with branch campuses, uh, so they're much larger. But UNC, uh, we have 102, uh, and out of, out of uh, classes of 160 to 170, and that average comes out to about 12.9%. So 12.9% compared to Indiana and Illinois, which are about 7.5 to 7.8%. So our success at Carolina is preponderantly because of our MED program, but also because of people like myself who look the part, who help these folks when they walk in believe that they can do it. And more importantly, is from as, the, as it goes from the field of dreams, if you build it, they will come. And when they come and they feel supported, they do well. And that's the take home message I'll leave with you today. How about one more round for all of our panelists?
Hello everyone, thank you for being here today. My name is Mariah Akande, and I am a recent graduate from the Brown AB MPH program. I graduated in 2017 from that five-year program. <laughs> It's an incredible honor and very humbling to be in a room full of successful and inspiring people of color, of black and brown alumni. And um, I know that a lot of us probably have lots of questions for our panelists today, and um, I don't wanna hog up all of your time, but I will start with a few questions. Since I see students in the audience and alumni of different ages, I just wanted to field to our panelists um, the question, how has Brown played a role in your lives and your career trajectories? So. Any of you can answer. Okay. Well, <clears throat> turn on. when I was, I knew I was gonna get some, a question from you like this. I, I do what I normally do is uh, they're going to have a few questions for me. So what should I do? Well, of course, I turn to my wife, <laughs> who's also a Brown uh, graduate, a class of 1978. And I say, what should I say? And she says, well, I don't care what you say. Don't try to be too charming or too witty or act too intellectual. Just be yourself. So to answer the question about, you know, what, what has Brown done for us to sort of our particular trajectory, uh, I, I can vividly remember uh, the times actually sitting in this place in, in sales, actually taking exams and, and learning from a lot of the people around me. Uh, the school is, is obviously a good proportion about what you learn in class, but the greater proportion is actually what you learn out of class. And I would have to say, for those of you who are on social media, if you just do an experiment tonight, look at the number of people that are your friends on Facebook or some other thing, and then ask the question, what proportion of those people you met here at Brown or were connected in some way? And I would bet you that is over 60% or so. So actually having friends that are with you for the next 30, 40, 50 years really does quite a bit. In terms of the institution, though, I would say a couple of things. One is uh, it really got me on a trajectory because of Brown's uh, way of thinking. They act, um, they think locally, but they act globally. And that was certainly true both from the undergraduate as well as the medical school that I was in. Brown also uh, is a place that, that, that not only values education, but they also value humanistic and other qualities that I think moves forward. And, and, the, and the, the third thing that I think is extremely important is that Brown not only teaches you items, but it also teaches you how to be a lifelong learner. And I think that's absolutely important because I can tell you that in the field of medicine that we are training people for careers that five and 10 years from now don't actually exist right now. And people are gonna be employing technology that currently doesn't exist in the field of medicine to actually treat diseases and disorders that we're not quite yet aware are diseases and disorders. We are born with a genetic background, but it's really our environment and our behavior which dictates our outcome. And there are many diseases that are on the horizon based upon the changes that are occurring in our environment and our behavior that lifelong learners will be in a good position to take care of. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would have to say. There's a UPS saying, what, has, what can Brown do for you? Brown has done a lot for us. <laughs> I'll answer by saying when I first arrived here in 2005 for um, my adult and pediatric infectious disease fellowship, I used to introduce myself by saying, hi, I'm Nicole, I'm from Brooklyn, I'll be returning to New York when I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> and so 12 years later, I am still here and um, certainly have appreciated um, some of what you've mentioned in terms of thinking local locally, but acting globally. I learned the benefit of being in um, 
uh, a capital city um, through fellowship, had been to the state house, you know, tens or 20, 20 times. And um, as a New Yorker, I still haven't gone to the Albany um, uh, state house. And uh, I really appreciated the support that I received from attendings and faculty here who could have said, you know, the legislative advocacy work that you are embarking on in fellowship does not qualify for any of the requirements you need to sit for the boards by the end of fellowship. But instead, they said, we've been trying to do this for the last five years, so keep going and we will figure out how to make it fit in terms of your um, fellowship. And that certainly attracted me to want to stay and learn and grow. And I've appreciated every moment of it. Um, the undergraduate taught me patience, hmm. uh, taught me resilience. Uh, it, it taught me, I, I went to a private boarding school. I, I was one of three in my class black that graduated in my graduating class. I was told I only got into brown because I was black. Hmm. Um, so I kind of had an imposter syndrome when I first came to Brown as an undergraduate. Uh, but fortunately, my, my high school prepared me well for freshman year. Sophomore year, maybe not. Uh, but that's also because I pledged and I worked work study and I played basketball. And I learned a valuable lesson that sophomore year, which was what are you going to do with yourself? Well. I wasn't much of a jumper, so I knew I wasn't going to the NBA. <laughs> and, you know, I, I had all my academics in front of me, and I had a pre-med advisor who said to me, and I really wish I could remember his, I, I, I wish I could remember his name. I can see his face, but I can't remember his name, <laughs> who told me, well, Cedric, it's okay to make a mistake. There's, no, there's, not, there's no, nothing wrong with failing and falling down, but what you gonna do next? And from him is when I realized that all I had to do was get back on the horse and find a better way to improve myself and to work harder. And that propelled me to get my grades up to the point that I was successful in entering medical school. Coming back from residency program and working with Shelly, she's the one that, that pushed me to actually do a study that looked at perceived barriers and bias in medical education <coughs> by race and by gender. And that pilot study ended up being a full study that I wrote with Valerie uh, Stone uh, that led to me going into academic medicine. And I have been grateful ever since. Uh, because <clears throat> there was no one that looked like me when I was going through medical school at a southern medical school, which was just like my boarding school. But at least now I'm there to be the difference for those students who are still coming through that southern medical school, but I have the ability to stand up for them in places they can't stand up for themselves. Thank you so much for your responses. I know um, as a person of color and for most of the people in this room who are people of color, it is not a surprise that we have been told either we don't belong, we see that we don't belong, or we're told we only got into brown because we're black. And you would think, wouldn't there be more people of color than that go here? if that were the case. Um, and so being a recent graduate and trying to find my own path and um, thinking about how difficult it was as a student to know my place going forward or even how to survive in such a competitive environment, what would be some advice you would give to your younger self or to the students or recent graduates in the audience? So if I, advice that I would give um, to my younger self, if I, I could go back, is um, to um, 
consider doing more than just science and math? I mean, I know that sounds just the opposite of, 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 of what you would expect somebody up here to say, but I can tell you that when I was here, that's really all I did. In fact, it got to a point where I tried to convince my friends. Um, for those of you who are old enough, you remember that there were particular classes at Brown that were considered very easy classes to get a, a, an A in. I won't use a term that we used to call it back then, but, but I tried. I think I made you to know. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually tried to convince, because I was so much involved in science and math, I tried to convince two friends of mine, one who was a history major and the other was a humanity major, to come and join me at Boris and Hawley in taking this class called Biomedical Radiation Physics. It was a graduate level course. I said, you're going to get an A in this class. And I guess there are a lot of people who thought it because on the first opening night of this class, for those of you who've been in bars in Holly, there are people actually sitting not only in all the seats, but even the aisles were completely filled. I guess everyone had heard this. And the teacher turned around and looked at all the people in the class. And he started putting these equations up on the board. And I tell you, by the break, all of the aisles were empty. <laughs> Uh, I, I realize now that actually if I had spent more time, you know, and at least spending some time more in humanities and learning a, a little bit more and broadening my perspective, I think it would have been to the good. Because now I'm in a position where I hire a lot of people and I realize that people in various generations have different expectations. And that's not something you actually learn from math and science. And, and really in terms of being in a leadership position, for example, it is those other qualities oftentimes that are intangible that you have to look for in terms of hiring and keeping on very good people. And so if I were to say something to my younger self, make sure you broaden your education. At a place like Brown, absolutely uh, important to have is liberal. And I don't want to use the term liberal. That's a good thing. As broad of a liberal education as you can. My major in undergrad was human development and family studies, so I fully echo <laughs> that approach because I definitely loved the non-bio-focused major. Um, the, the message I would uh, give would be to um, take all of the, um, the journeys and experiences that I've seen uh, colleagues go through and gone through myself to um, make clear for students early on in the, the career the sense of belonging that we've been talking about, the imposter syndrome component. It's something that I've wanted to better understand because over the years of seeing so many brilliant, brilliant colleagues of mine struggle either with a um, standardized exam or how they were treated during the course of their career. And mostly everyone overcame, but it was at a, a great expense. Um, and so being able, I see such power and value in telling students early on, don't listen to um, the negative or the you only got here because or all of the signs and demonstrations that say that you don't belong, that we get um, continually uh, reminded and almost attacked with on a daily basis subliminally um, and really find that grounding where you can tell yourself you are here because you belong here, you are here because you're intelligent. Um, that's something that we have to constantly remind ourselves of now. And so the earlier um, that we can make sure that our students have that um, grounding and truth, the better. The one thing that I wish that I had done or thought about back then was to do something international. You yeah. know, uh, my, my world was so small because my world was, you know, I was in North Carolina. And then my parents, when we went on a vacation, we went to the beach in North Carolina. You know, we went to New York one time in my life, and I was four, and I don't remember it. You know, uh, we went to Virginia one or two times. So for me, the world was very, very small. Today, I tell my students to start thinking about doing international activities because the world is very, very small. 
And I think by going out and learning about how other people live, you come back and you have a better appreciation for what not only what you have, but also the things that they do better that we never hear about, which is why their health outcomes are better. And we could learn how to implement them here. Thank you. So yes, I'd like to invite questions from the audience. Um, if a lot of people have questions, we can field two to three questions at one time and then ask the panelists to answer. Yeah. Mine's right over there. Uh, Shelly was really one of my, she, he, she, Ann, and Dom Tamara were all of my residency program. Uh, and they were really one of my first academic mentors. I had Mr. Larry Keith, who ran the MED program, who was my, and a frat brother of mine, who was my grounded mentor when I was in medicals. He was the one that made sure that I did not fail out. Um, I had, when I came back here and did residency program, I met a guy by the name of Arthur Wright, uh, who was Arthur David's father. Some of y'all may know who Arthur David was. He passed a while back from colon cancer. Uh, he just passed a couple of weeks ago from prostate cancer, but he became my surrogate father. And I had another surrogate father when I started working at the VA in North Carolina. So I've always had an affinity for looking for older gentlemen to be my mentor, but I also learned very, very early that they don't have to look like you to be a successful mentor. I agree. I appreciate also the importance of being purposeful about it, and that within itself is an education um, for students, as well as making clear that the mentors can be from a variety of components. You don't need one mentor to cover everything, but to have uh, different mentors to help guide different aspects of what you need, and to make sure that what you're hearing um, resonates with your truth. Because, um, you know, it's so often you wonder sh how should we invest better in guidance counselors? Because if we ask for, um, you know, a raise of hands of all the people that had guidance counselors that told them they shouldn't come this route or wouldn't be able to make it. What, is, what does that look like if everyone raised their hands of guidance counselors mm -hmm. that told them not to? Yes, so we should put some investment in that, but at least make sure that students are aware to not just take everything with the grain, you know, not just take everything as truth if it doesn't feel like it feels like the truth for you. I, th I think your, your point is uh, extremely valuable in terms of mentors. When, when I was here, I can tell you, I had several along the way. And the thing about good mentors is you want to accumulate them. Um, because you have a new one doesn't mean you, do, you get rid of the old ones. And so I sort of accumulated mentors. I had an outstanding one actually when I was a freshman in this medical program here, uh, Dr. Pierre Galletti, who was actually one of the first deans of this medical school. And, um, and because of his connections, he was actually able to get me my first summer job back at home uh, at a place in New Orleans called Alton Ochsner Medical uh, Institution. He actually called the person who started it because they were good friends. And when I actually went there for a job, the understanding was I work in the lab, but being in New Orleans, of course, they thought I was, I was supposed to be one of the groundskeepers. And he called these people up and <laughs> The rest is history. I actually worked there for several 
summers in a row, actually in a hematology lab. That could be one of the reasons that I actually gra gravitated to this. Another person who was an outstanding mentor to me in medical school, there were actually two. Uh, one um, was uh, Dr. Charles McDonald, mm. who was the head of the dermatology yeah. department here. Right. Uh, and he was a, a tremendous inspiration, but actually something that he was doing at the time, I have to say, led to some of the discoveries that I've made my own academic uh, career. Uh, the other person was, was my mentor and my thesis advisor, Dr. Lichtman, who was the um, was the medical director at Miriam Hospital. I did my research in hematology with him. And I never forget a piece of advice that, that he gave me when, uh, when, when I was leaving to go off to do my residency. He says, you know, there are uh, two pieces of advice that are critical uh, that you should know. He said, the first piece of advice is not to give everyone what your secrets are or your advice. I mean, he was joking, of course, but, but I think what he was trying to say is that you really have to develop a network and get people to be your, not only your mentors, but people who kind of advocate for you, your advocates, a slight difference. Um, I, I would be remiss without saying what a great role Levi Adams has had for all of us. He's been an outstanding mentor and really a person who has really done a lot for so many of us. And then the final thing that I would say about mentors is that it's, I realize in my current position that not every institution have people like us. And so I've actually created now 15 years ago something called a network of minority research investigators. And what this does is it actually gives people virtual mentors. So they can be at some remote institution but talk to people online or over the phone about things related to promotion and development, and especially in the biomedical research space. We'll take two questions at a time, and we have a, a floating microphone, so ma'am in the front. Okay, so my name is Laura Hassan, class of 84, I've been listening to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. And um, my question is, my question is, um, a lot of physicians say that our high maternal and infant mortality rate is based on diabetes, um, opioids, hypertension, and obesity, okay? But with us being 50th in the World Health Organization's number, where there are 49 countries that have better outcomes than we do, right? And I'm sure some of those women have hypertension, they're obese, and they are, uh, might have some opioid problems and hypertension. Um, what do you think um, is the reason? Because as a midwife, I have one-on-one, um, -on -one, I get to work with them one-on-one, -on -one, and I don't see that being the problem. And I'm talking acro over the, uh, across the board, not just African Americans. We're dying, women, we, we women are dying twice as much, and our babies are dying three to four times as much. And if you don't know that in this audience, you need to know. Because if white women and white babies were dying as much as we were dying, it would be woo, you know? It would be really something to, um, uh, they would be advertising it or trying to solve the problem. I think the problem is racism because um, I've seen a lot of studies that talk about racism, but most of the um, physicians that I talk to name the four reasons that I named um, earlier, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, and whatever, opioids. Right. So since I have a panel of academicians and researchers who are African American, I want to know what you got. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll answer that from what I read yesterday flying here. I read a, a very poignant article, expose in USA Today, that talked about uh, female maternal deaths. Uh, didn't talk about it from just the African American perspective, it talked about it from across the board. And that many women are dying in childbirth and around the childbirth period uh, at 
disproportionate rates for a country that is so developed as ours. Um, and the question began, and, and what I feel the question is, is we tend to externalize blame and not look at the mirror to figure out what it is we're doing to contribute to that. So I, I think from a medical, medical profession perspective, uh, it's called the 5%. Okay, how many people believe health disparities exist? You know, all these doctors raise their hand. How many of them think that they exist uh, in your community? They raise their hand. How many of them think they exhibit in your practice? Less people raise their hand. How many think that you are part of it? Only 5% raise their hand. <laughs> Okay, so to me, that's, that's telling. We, we need to be able to be honest about our mistakes in medicine uh, and examine our mistakes because we perfected nothing. We practice medicine. And until we really start to look at our practice of medicine and those outcomes seriously without regard for litigation, because, you know, in some states, they don't even report maternal deaths. Rhode Island doesn't even have a, and I, I hate to say this, but it's in the heart. <laughs> Give her a chance. Yeah, you can tell her. Herself, I, I, right? I'll let her tell you. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to say? I was going to say that in the, Rhode Island is one of the states that doesn't even have a commission to even look at maternal deaths. Mm -hmm. And so that's something, you know, we have 18 states in this nation that don't even look at it. Mm -hmm. And it's, that means that and, and it's, and reporting a maternal death is actually optional in a lot of states as well. So how are we going to address something that's optional? How do we address something that we don't even look at? So we have um, an infant mortality uh, task force um, here in, the, in, the, in Rhode Island and um, work hard to make prominent that there is a race element to that and a very significant issue of black infant mortality that is um, exponentially um, more uh, disparate than other races. And one of our key approaches in addressing it is um, focusing on determinants of health um, as being um, uh, the, uh, the approach to start to chip away at fixing that. And by determinants of health, I mentioned earlier, social, economic, and environmental, um, we also understand the importance of structural determinants of health that include racism and the other ism similar to what you um, have mentioned. So um, that is what we would say is the major direction that we need to take with it. And we um, do have a child death mortality review team and even just this week among our leadership at the department began the conversation, not began, but continued the conversations about what's needed to activate the um, maternal um, review team that you were correct and that we don't have, but we're deciding that we could um, just start to pull that together without requiring legislation to do it, to begin to tackle that too. And how much funding do you <laughs> yes. We can field more questions. Uh, I believe there's a mic here, and then we'll pass it back. So this question uh, uh, moves across the entire panel. So we started out talking about uh, genetics, and you know I'm a strong believer in pharmacogenetics and genomics and uh, big data and so forth. But what's happening now is big data is being used to also gather information about us that will be used against us. So there is a company that screens all prescriptions that are filled with a credit card. They scrub your name, but they keep your zip code, they keep your medications and where you live. So what happens is they can tell how many people on your block have hypertension, how many have diabetes and so forth. So that data is being collected and some insurance companies, um, health systems and others decide where to build their clinic and they will build it 12 blocks beyond the last public health stop, uh, uh, bus stop so that poor people don't come. But what I'm concerned with is a friend of mine, has, his wife had cancer. Um, he used a supercomputer to analyze it and came up with an old therapy that was used to save her life. Now, she was told that she had incurable cancer. And if she had been a woman of color, she would have been put in a hospice program and she would be dead. She's walking around live now because of the fact that her husband's a doctor at a major hospital and that they were able to utilize that. that. So moving from the research end to 
the community and the socioeconomic uh, fact, we're having a problem deciding who will do the screening for socioeconomic factors. Now, in Dr. Bright's field, those who look like you understand your culture and are more likely to understand your situation. But when you look at the most diverse colleges, the, the bar for blacks and Hispanics is not increasing the way the, the bar for other minorities is. So even though the top colleges are more diverse, we're not doing well. I've been, I came to Brown in 63 and I studied biomedical engineering. It was shortly after they stopped using Model Ts to move the teams around. And so that, what happens is uh, we haven't made a lot of progress. I worked from the early 70s till currently for 50 years looking at recruitment uh, on the committee to end healthcare disparities. And you know, we looked at various ways to start at the beginning. We started a kindergarten. And to, to your point about salvaging people who don't get into medical school, we looked at post back programs. And it turns out that California is the only state that has, a, other than North Carolina apparently, that has an affordable program that allows us to recapture some of those folks that don't get into medical school. So even though we have tremendous ways to get a lot of data, we still come down to the fact that we don't have enough practitioners and people who look and practice like you know, on our population to give us the benefit of all the advances. Thank you so much for that comment. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time for responses or questions as a whole audience, but I would like to invite everyone here to stay in the room for a reception. This is a celebration. We're celebrating 50 years of black alumni at Brown, and so I really hope that everyone can stick around, talk to our panelists, talk to each other, and have a good time. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. Awesome. <laughs> Cedric, as always.